very excited tonight to introduce two, uh, two exceptional uh, people in the passive house world. Um, we have uh, James Dean. Uh, James is uh, uh, known to many of us uh, as a, a clean tech entrepreneur with a passion for innovation and healthy buildings and sustainability. Uh, he's founded at least three clean energy technology companies uh, and uh, uh, Oxygenate, uh, Core, and Greenlight Power. Um, James, uh, before founding Greenlight, James was with uh, KPMG uh, Consulting. And we know that uh, James is committed to sustainability in his personal life. Uh, he recently built West Vancouver's first passive house certified to the PHI Plus standard. Uh, James was recognized as one of Canada's top 40 under 40 and was a finalist in the EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, he's also uh, on the boards of the Home Ventilating Institute, Fuel Cells Canada, uh, and Science World. Uh, he's also a member of the Dakin North American Advisory Board. So uh, really excited to hear what James has to say. And with James tonight is someone else who's well known in the, the neighborhood, Stuart Hood, who brings uh, to tonight's event uh, over 30 years of building engineering experience to uh, Integral Group uh, as a leader in low carbon sustainable building design. Uh, uh, Stuart's project portfolio ranges across all sectors of the building environment. Uh, but with a focus on complex facilities uh, such as uh, laboratories or laboratories for our American uh, friends on the call tonight, uh, museums, law enforcement centers, corporate offices. Um, he has experience working on projects in Europe and Asia. Stuart also brings a global perspective to his clients. Um, he seeks progressive technologies and strategies to incorporate into North American projects and follows leading edge sustainability trends globally. Uh, Stuart is active in the passive house community and has been involved in designing mechanical systems for many passive house projects, including, as I said earlier, fire halls, community centers, multi-unit residential buildings, and high performance homes. So welcome to James and to Stuart. Uh, and with that, I will pass the torch to you gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks uh, Chris for that uh, kind introduction and, and thanks to Passive Host Accelerator for hosting Stuart and I. Um, and maybe, maybe I'll start back five years ago when I had the idea to build a net zero energy home and be, became familiar with Passive Host through a company I was working with uh, Zender. And uh, I approached my wife and I think she did what any wife would do and did a Google search on Passive House and came back and said, James, you know, I admire you for your beliefs in sustainability, but it seems like a lot of these passive houses look quite boxy and have really small windows. So, so I decided to take on the challenge to see if we could build uh, a beautiful home that was energy efficient, healthy, comfortable and fun. And, um, you know, we've been living in the home for three years now and really kind of excited the whole family with, with how it turned out. So I want to share with you some of the lessons that were learned along the way and, and some of the exciting technologies that we used. And we took quite a few risks because some of the things we implemented hadn't been done before. Uh, and I think, you know, the key reason for the success, and it's not going to be a surprise, was just building a, a stellar team. Um, so I want to give a shout out to our architect, Battersby Howitt, who's known for their contemporary designs. Uh, the builder, Nikoon, had never done a passive house before, uh, but had done a lot of net zero energy homes. And then Stewart's firm, Integral Group, uh, did all the mechanical design. Um, structural, you'll, you'll learn we built with cross laminated timber and concrete, uh, which presented some challenges, but Aspect uh, did a fantastic job on that. And some of you may know Marcel Studer, who was our passive house consultant and, and did a great job. Uh, so some details on the home, it's in West Vancouver and it turns out that the North shore of Vancouver is one of the perfect places to build uh, passive homes because we've got great orientation. We've got beautiful views to the South. And, and as we'll learn here, we really were able to take advantage of the, the solar thermal gain. 
Um, we started the process five years ago and then moved in three years ago. So it was about two, a two year construction process. Uh, the house is uh, a little over 4,000 square feet. Um, and we have 12 kilowatts of solar panels on the roof, which has been really kind of helpful. You'll see at the end, we didn't quite hit a net zero energy. We're pretty close, um, but the solar was definitely a big part of uh, getting there. We were a little bit worried about the air tightness test and meeting the you know, very stringent requirements of Passive House at 0.6 ACH 50, and we're happy that we came in at about half of that. Um, and we've won a, a number of awards. One that you know I was quite proud of was the Canadian Green Building uh, Council uh, for Innovative Home. Um, and one thing I, I also wanted to mention I was very proud of is we partnered up with the BCIT, which is one of the, the local colleges here in Vancouver, and they did an eight-part documentary uh, following all the different steps of the construction. Um, so if you're interested in seeing that, you can go to YouTube um, and download those uh, videos, which are really informative. So as mentioned, we built with cross laminated timber and it, at the time, the main reason that we did it was Nikun had told me we could take about two months off the construction schedule. So while they were pouring the concrete for the first floor, uh, it was a factory in Oregon uh, called DR Johnson was building those panels in parallel. And I also, you know, like the fact um, that it was built indoors in a, a climate controlled factory. Um, many of you probably know in Vancouver, it's a beautiful city, but we're also known for our rain and the idea of, um, you know, carpenters, you know, pounding nails and the, and the pouring rain um, did not seem the best. So, um, but for me, you know, having lived in the home for three years, there's a couple of learnings I had. One, um, just the whole construction with CLT just seems so much more robust than building with, you know, stick frame construction. So it was really, you know, this is a home I hope will be here for hundreds of years, you know, because of the materials that we used. Uh, secondly, I learned a new term called embodied carbon and that, you know, building with solid wood panels like that is much better than building with steel um, or, or concrete. And I think the biggest thing for me was, um, and you'll see in that picture down at the bottom right hand corner, you've got the CLT panel and then either side we had um, six inches of uh, rock wall. Um, was the, the thermal storage that was able to be contained in, in, in the homes. And we'll talk about that in this uh, next slide here. So this was a, a, you know, a day in, in the fall of last year. It was um, a little bit cold outside. It was about 12 degrees Celsius. And because of the solar thermal gain um, coming in, you know, our bedroom was 28 degrees uh, Celsius. So that was three o'clock in the afternoon. I took that, that picture there. And uh, so we do have a heat pump that Stuart will talk about for cooling and heating. Um, but what I did to cool the bedroom down was open the windows and doors. And so we were you know, basically able to get free cooling and, and free ventilation. So you can see, you know, for 50 minutes later, we were able to drop that temperature down to a comf comfortable 21 degrees and then close the door. And you can see because of the the mass in the, the envelope in the walls, um, that temperature bounced back up to 24 and a half degrees. And then I took another picture the following day because I was curious, you know, uh, how much is that temperature inside going to drop? Um, and you can see because of how well insulated the walls and the windows are that we just had a small drop in, in temperature. Um, the one thing I would probably do different now um, is put the windows on actuators and tie it into, you know, some sort of smart control system that knows when to open and close the windows to get that free cooling and free ventilation. Because what happens now is when you go up to that 28 degrees, the heat pump kicks in and we have mechanical cooling. And there's really no need to waste energy with the mechanical cooling when we can have the free cooling from, from the outside air. And the ERV we have does have a bypass in it to get some free cooling, but really I wish that um, when we're not home, that those windows knew to, uh, to open automatically. And we've had days where it's been below freezing outside uh, and a really sunny day and it's been 30 degrees. So it was really surprising to me just to see, um, you know, how much heating we can get naturally from the sun. And you'll see in, in you know, the pictures earlier, we've got quite big overhangs which are great in the summertime for blocking the sun. Uh, but what's beautiful in the spring and the fall and the wintertime when we want that solar thermal gain and the sun's low in the sky, 
um, we get that on all three levels of, uh, of the home. It just shows here, um, you know, that window there. So we've got one door here and we've got a window in the bathroom there. And those are the ones that I open up on this level uh, to prevent the overheating. So I'm gonna pa pass it over to Stuart to talk about the, uh, the mechanical system uh, that we've got and, and we're quite proud of. Thanks, thanks James. Um, yeah, so um, the mechanical system, you know, two, two major components. Um, we have the, um, the Zender ERV that might be familiar to a lot of people. That was the Q600. I think it was the first one that, uh, that came into, uh, into Canada. Um, and then we have a Daikin Altherma heat pump system. Um, the Daikin Altherma is a, yeah, it's a air to water heat pump. So, it, you know, very much like a, a mini split, but instead of uh, air to refrigerant and then to air inside the house, it's air to water and then water to air within, within the house it's, uh, itself. So it's a hydronic system uh, from, a, from a distribution perspective. <clears throat> And uh, and what we did, we went with the the, the pure passive house passive house uh, methodology, and that we used the the air to do all of the heating and cooling of the house, so the ventilation air. So what we do is uh, in the uh, top left hand picture, you can see there's two there's two boxes in the in the ductwork. They're uh, heating heating cooling changeover coils. Uh, one of them does the uh, the 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 upper two floors and the uh, the other one does the lower floor. The lower floor has um, has a slightly different um, <clears throat> you know, load profile because it's got a really deep overhang on that lower floor and it's connected to the earth. It's sort of a built into the hillside. And so it's slightly different from a thermal perspective. Um, and so the, uh, the the heat pump, it takes its heat out of the out of the air and then moves it uh, through the refrigerant to the, to the split heat pump. You see that on the right-hand side, what you see there is the hydro box, the refrigerant pipe comes into that and then transfers that, uh, that energy into, uh, into hot water. And it does two things. It heats and cools, uh, heats the air through the, the ventilation system, but it also uh, preheats the, uh, the domestic hot water. So when there's a call for domestic hot water, the, the, uh, the, the, heat pump ramps up, heats the, uh, the water within the heat pump to about 55 degrees centigrade, which is then able to preheat the domestic hot water up to about 45 degrees centigrade. And then the electric heater within the hot water tank does the, does the rest of, uh, of that heat. Um, and so it just goes to show it's, uh, you know, you can, you can heat and cool through that ventilation air with, uh, without the need for that supplementary uh, system and without the need for, um, uh, for other devices. Uh, in terms of the layout, you can see there this sort of um, in the top left hand corner is the, uh, the Q600. Uh, to the right of that is the domestic hot water tank with the preheating pipe going into the side of it. Bottom left hand corner is, the, um, is that hydro box that I referred to. And uh, just above that is the uh, is the buffer tank. So we uh, charge that with uh, with heating water or with chilled water, depending uh, depending on the season. Um, if that's full of chilled water, um, then it stays cool, and the domestic hot water preheat doesn't cool that down. It just diverts. You can see there's a branch just in between the two devices that branches around to the domestic hot water tanks. It does swing that water from chilled water to heating water in that that small volume of, uh, of water in that pipe, but it doesn't change the temperature of the, uh, of the buffer tank itself. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you just see the ventilation distribution there, the blue being the, uh, uh, the supplier going through those two uh, coils in, the, uh, in those two uh, turquoise colored uh, boxes are the uh, heating and cooling coils for the floors. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so one of the interesting things that happened over the last year was we had a heat dome out here, just probably some of the highest temperatures I've seen um, since I've lived in, in Vancouver for the last 20 years. And then we also had a re real cold spell where I think it got down to like minus eight or minus nine. And um, what was interesting for me was we didn't even really need to use that heating and cooling system through those events. So in the winter time, uh, you'll see here, we were able to install a wood stove. Uh, it's from a Swedish company called Stuve. And we were essentially doing um, heating for the whole house through that, that wood stove. And then in the, uh, the days where it was really hot, uh, we just opened the windows and doors. And, and because we've got the ocean in front of us 
and the wind blowing across the, the water there, that's what we had our, our cooling system. But it's good to know that, you know, with climate change and as temperatures rise or, or get colder, that we, we do have that supplementary um, heating and cooling. I uh, mentioned earlier the blower door test. We were a little bit worried whether we we're going to pass that, you know, just having um, this wood stove in here. Um, but there are dampers that have been installed with the switch over here. So when they're not being used, there is no air leakage going through that. And then there's a glass door that also uh, slides along here. And then on two of the levels, we have sliding glass doors. Um, and we were concerned with the seals that potentially we're going to get leakage there. Uh, but the suppliers of those sliding doors had the, the leak data that um, uh, the whole team felt comfortable that we were going to still be able to pass that, uh, that blower door test. So one of the things I learned through COVID was just the importance of relative humidity um, and that we really want to be in that sweet spot between 40 and 60 percent. And if homes dry out, um, it can, you know, cause the spread of the virus. You know, one is these aerosols can float around more. And, and secondly, you know, the mucous membranes inside, you know, can't fight the virus as much if it's too dry. So we had some debates about, do we put an HRV in or an ERV in? We knew in, you know, down in the South, you want an ERV and in cold climates, you want an ERV. Um, but what we decided to do was put an ERV in here to recapture the humidity. And we think it was the right decision because you can see here, you know, throughout the season, we were within that 40 to, to 60% uh, bandwidth. Um, the other thing for health was filtration. Um, so yeah, the Zender unit comes with a MERV 14 filter on the outside air side, I'll show you in the next slide that we've had some issues with, uh, with forest fires. And then the, um, the ERV is sized for about 360 CFM. So we, we've got continuous high air change rates uh, through the home. And what was interesting is over the last three years, you know, nobody in our family has been sick. Nobody's gotten a, uh, the flu or a cold or gotten COVID. And I believe that's you know related to the relative humidity, the air changes, and, and as well as having great filtration inside the home. And so we've had, I think for the last three years, we've had quite bad forest fires, either in British Columbia or down in Washington and Oregon, where the um, you know the winds have blown the smoke up. And uh, so I changed out the the MER 14 filters. Uh, the smoke came in. And just out of interest sake, I went and I pulled out the, uh, the filter just to see how much particulate was in there. And, and that was six days later, you could see how black that, that filter was. So again, just highlighted the importance to me to make sure that we've got you know, the right filtration, you know, particularly on the outside air you know, coming into the, the home. And Stuart, do you wanna talk, I know you and I had lots of debates about uh, whether whether to exhaust the range hood and the dryer and uh, maybe talk about kind of the approach we took and why. And I'll, I'll talk about whether it was a good, a good idea or a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of debate over, you know, should we take that that kitchen air, you know, from the from the from the stove, from the range and, and take it outside. Uh, and, you know, or should we use a recirculating uh, range hood? And James was second guessing, but I think the one of the biggest things that drove it actually was the fireplace decision, right? You know, these range heads come usually, you know, the standard range heads that you come these big, you know, I think it was a Miele one or something like that, James, it was like minimum 300 CFM or something like that. Well, when you do the depressurization test, you know, you only need about 150 CFM, you know, to make take this house down a negative 50 Pascal. So if you've got a fire on and you then, uh, and then you, in that stove and uh, you, you, then you turn your range head on, you're going to take the uh, the pressure of that house down below 50 pascals, possibly down to sort of like you know 75 or 100 pascals with that much air getting getting exhausted out of it. So without a make up air system, or you know opening a window or something like that, you know you're going to potentially pull the uh, the products of combustion out of that fireplace and into the, into the home when you open it up. And so we decided to go with the uh, recirculating range hood. We ducted it uh, from the uh, from the range hood. You can see that slatted grill that's just in the uh, in that uh, downstand bulkhead, and it discharges out of there. And then you can see just uh, you know six feet away from it is the uh, is the kitchen exhaust. So that's going directly to the ERV. So we're sort of blowing it directly over there so that we can uh, grab that heat and moisture and take it out of there at high level in the uh, in the kitchen. Uh, but it's already pre-filtered and taken any any grease and uh, dirt out of the uh, out of the airstream. 
So how does it work, James? Yeah, no, we've been really happy with, you know, I think the main concern was um, just odors throughout the house. And, um, you know, with in the, in the recirculating range hood here, we have carbon filters. And I think with having the return air, the ERV kind of separated from here, um, there's been no issues whatsoever. And I think for me, just the, the simplicity of the design and not having to put that makeup air um, into the home and then the energy loss associated with that makeup air. And then on the dryer, Stuart, I think, you know, we had some debates on that. We ended up going with a ductless heat pump dryer. Um, and I'm happy we didn't need the makeup air for that. Um, the, it does take a little bit longer to dry the clothes, um, if I'm honest, with the heat pump dryers versus the, the traditional type dryers. But um, yeah, overall, we're, we're happy with both of those decisions. Um, so I, I'm sure as all of you are familiar, one of the key principles of, of Passive House is no thermal bridges. This was a really um, cool cantilevered concrete deck. I'll show you in the next slide here. You know, there's really only this one post support, supporting this. It's probably a 15 foot long cantilevered uh, deck here. Um, and then inside the home is also a concrete slab. So we needed to thermally break that. We used this product um, from a, a German company called Schuck. It's called the, I guess the Isocore. And so you can see this foam block and then there's this stainless steel uh, rebar going through it. So for me, I studied uh, structural engineering um, and, and I was just shocked that with that one post and this being camped to leave it out and having a foam block separate these two, that it would have the strength. And so Aspect, the structural engineer, reassured me that um, it was going to be safe to, to stand underneath that. Um, so that was kind of an innovative feature. And then the other one I thought what was good, this is uh, one of my son's bedrooms and you can see that it's cantilevered off of the back and it's suspended um, from the CLT uh, panels here. So I thought that was kind of a cool design feature. And then the other thing was we didn't need to put a thermal break in here because the CLT panel runs continuously through from the outside to the inside. And I guess the, um, I think this is Doug, for the, uh, the CLT panel here, it naturally kind of has that break there. And then lastly, you know, we were shooting for uh, net zero energy. Um, this is our, you know, BC Hydro, you're able to go in and track all your energy use. So I looked at it over the last three years. And so our annual, annual monthly electricity consumption is just under about 900 um, kilowatt hours. You can see here in, in the summer months, so sort of uh, March through August, we're pretty close to zero, but in the winter time where we're not getting as much um, sun on the solar panels, you can see we are purchasing um, electricity from the utility. Um, we do have an electric car um, and I do have two teenage boys that love to have long showers and leave all the lights on. So I'm sort of blaming them for us not being at net, net zero energy. Um, Stuart and I recently have done some sub metering. So we put these kind of donuts around um, to see if there's ways for us um, to optimize, you know, things like I was talking about earlier of, you know, not having the heat pump come on um, when we get overheating in the bedrooms and having the, the doors and windows open automatically to get that free cooling. So we still think there is some, uh, some room for optimization. I think the EUI for this, and that people are interested in kind of EUI numbers as opposed to sort of uh, you know PER numbers, it's a, it's working out at about a thirty-five EUI over there. Yeah, but and but I think there's a lot in the car. It's surprising. I've I've got an electric car as well in a similar sized home, but mine's not a passive house home, and it's just surprising how much um, energy the car uses. I think the you know the, the car for my home has probably added about. Um, 25 percent you know onto my uh, my energy bill for my, for my home right so it's uh, it's quite surprising how much it uh, is especially in the winter time right you, you don't get the efficiencies at tesla post uh, when you get into the winter time and uh, the colder weather so, so that's it for the presentation but just yeah finally a big thanks to Stuart, the integral team night coon battersby how it um you know a lot of things we were doing at the time three years ago uh, was new and we we took some chances but uh, my wife and and boys and I are really happy with with the house